The purpose of the suspension is to provide a more comfortable ride by isolating the rider from irregular road conditions and help the rider maintain stability and control when changing speed and direction. How the springs are adjusted has a substantial effect on that. A spring is an energy storage device. When you hit a bump, the energy created by this bump is stored for a moment in the spring as it compresses and then releases as it rebounds. A very stiff spring will store and release energy more rapidly than a softer spring. Too stiff a spring or spring adjustment setting makes the bike react harshly to the road surface and uses less suspension travel. Too soft a spring or spring adjustment allows the suspension to use more of its travel but responds too slowly to handle rapid road surface changes and gives a loose sort of feeling. We can vary the feel and handling of the bike by changing the spring preload towards a softer or harder setting. Preload means capturing a spring and compressing it to less than its free extended length. The more preload you put on the spring, the stiffer it will feel. Fortunately, there are guidelines and simple adjustments we can make to customize our spring settings to conditions and rider preferences for handling and feel. We call this sag adjustment. Sag means sink or settle from pressure or weight. There are two kinds of sag. One, rider sag. Rider sag is a measurement of how much the forks and shock springs compress with the rider on board. Two, static sag is a measurement of how much the forks and shock springs compress from the bike's own weight when at rest with no rider on board. Today, we're going to adjust rider sag. The first step in adjusting rider sag is to measure the front and rear suspension in their fully extended positions. Once we have that measurement, we will put the rider on the bike and measure how much his weight compresses or sags the springs. On sport bikes, used for track or racing, the range for rider sag on both the forks and shock is between 20 and 30 percent of the overall travel. Road bike settings are set softer, usually around 30 or 35 percent of the travel. Once again, this depends on rider preference and surface conditions, as well as riding environments such as street, track, or racing. The tools you'll need to adjust the preload on this bike are a 14 millimeter T-handle socket. That's for the front preload adjustment. It's 14 millimeters on this bike. Could be different on yours. A large hammer. And that hammer will drive this drift, and that's how we unlock and adjust the, the preload adjustment on the rear shock, and a tape measure that also measures in millimeters. Here's what you will need to make these adjustments to your bike. Helpers, one to hold the bike while the rider sits on it, and one to do the measuring and write them down. Helping today are Dylan and Kobe, and our rider, Josh and Shane will keep track of our settings. What SAG settings are we shooting for here? What is your preference and uh, what conditions are you going to ride the bike in? Uh, well, I'm going to be riding the bike at a racetrack, so uh, just kind of a, a base setting will go for 30 millimeters in the front and 30 millimeters of SAG in the rear. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Yep. Okay, let's start out by measuring the fully extended position of the, both the forks and the rear shock. Josh, you can step over there for a second. All right, measuring the forks is easy. You just lever the bike up on its side stand to take the weight off the front wheel and measure the length of the exposed fork tube. That is the fully extended position. All right, Kobe. One hundred thirty-seven millimeters. One hundred thirty-seven millimeters. Good, Shane. Write that down. Great. Okay. Good. Uh, now the rear. To get an accurate measurement, find a spot on the swing arm and a spot on the tail section to take the measurement. Usually, hooking the end of the pull tape on the axle is easiest for the swing arm position. Make sure you go straight up from the swing arm position to the tail section to get an accurate measurement. You may have to put a piece of tape on the tail section if there isn't a suitable surface to measure from.
All right, 619 millimeters. 619 millimeters, okay, good. Write it down, very good. Now we'll hold the bike and put our rider on board and measure the fork and shock sag. Josh? Well, you'll notice that Josh has his leathers and his helmet, so we want to get the complete rider weight on this. All right. Now always have the rider bounce on the bike and take the reading once it settles, which he already did. And what do we have on the front forks? What is, what is that? 104 millimeters. 104 millimeters, okay, write that down. Good. Uh, what have we got in the rear shock? Wanna bounce again? There you go. Five hundred and ninety four millimeters. Okay, five ninety four. Now in a case where one of the sag numbers is significantly out of adjustment, it's important to solve this first before measuring the other end. Reason being, this can cause the other end of the bike to be out of adjustment as well. For example, on a Ducati Monster SR4, it is common to have 50 plus millimeters of sag in the rear. This effectively takes all of the weight off the front end of the bike, causing the sag at the forks to be too small like 20 millimeters. But by uh, adding preload to the shock and getting the preferred 30 to 35 millimeter sag number, uh, depending on use of, of the bike, of course, this will cause much more weight to be transferred to the front of the bike and put the sag number much closer to the optimal number. Now, when you measure the front, you'll find the sag is close to 30 millimeters, so you won't need to adjust the fork preload as much as initially thought. In this case, the bike is pretty, pretty close. Okay, our rider told us he'd like 30 millimeters on the forks and 30 millimeters on the shock, so we have to add three millimeters of preload on the forks and take out five millimeters in the shock by adjusting the preload. We got the sag measurement by subtracting the rider on number from the fully extended number. In this case, it's 137 millimeters less 104 millimeters, and that equals 33 millimeters on the forks we'll need to go three millimeters to get his preferred sag. Okay, we aren't too far off on either end, so let's adjust the forks and add preload. Kobe, see handle? All right. The fork preload is adjusted with this nut just outside the rebound adjuster screw. It is usually, which is this, It's usually 14 millimeters, and this T-handle wrench is the best tool for the job, but you can use an open end or box wrench or socket for the job. Most fork preload adjusters have rings like these. You can count the visible rings and jot the number down for your start point and end point. Also, on most bikes, one turn on the fork preload adjuster equals one millimeter of change in the sag. So I'm going to turn it in three turns. Half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half, Three. All right. <clears throat> Let's have our rider climb back onto the bike and see what we've got so far. One hundred and seven millimeters. Okay. Good. So, one hundred and seven millimeters from our start point of one hundred and thirty-seven. One hundred and thirty-seven. Good. So that's, we have 30 millimeters. All right. <laughs> Just what you wanted for the forks. Perfect. Okay. Let's do the shock now. It was 594 millimeters and needs to be 589 millimeters. So we'll subtract five millimeters by loosening the preload. Rear shocks are a little different and usually harder to adjust because of their location and fastener arrangement. Most shocks have a double lock ring that must first be loosened before you can turn it. 
The top ring locks off the bottom ring, and first we have to loosen it with the hammer and the drift, and then spin it up away from the lower ring, which is holding pressure on the spring. This can be time consuming, as you will only be able to move the ring about an eighth of a turn at a time. One other tool that's a good uh, idea to have on your hands is a uh, felt tip marker. It's a good idea to mark both the ring and the shock so you can see your progress. Kobe, there you go. Generally, one turn of the adjuster will give you two to three millimeters of added or reduced sag. In this case, we have to move it five millimeters, so it will take about one and a half turns. First thing we'll have to do is separate the two uh, rings, the locking ring on top, which will take a small amount of force. Go ahead, Kobe. Great, have you got it marked? Yes, sir. Excellent, okay. So we're going to take out about one and a half turns. So go for it. There. Let's see what we have now. Back on with the rider and remeasure this sag, which in this case is rider. It does its bounce. Good. It settles. We remeasure. We come up 589 with millimeters. 589 millimeters. Okay. 589 millimeters is exactly what we were looking for, and we've got 30 millimeters of sag in the rear. That's perfect. Good. Now let's tighten the lock ring. Thanks, Josh. You bet. Your bike is adjusted. Ready to race. Now let's tighten the lock ring so the preload adjuster can't back off while you ride the bike. Great, okay, there you have it. It can happen that the spring itself is either too hard or too soft. You would know this because the preload adjusters would not bring the sag into a usable range. Another clue that your spring rate is wrong is you have to use all of the preload adjustment, in or out, to get your settings right. <clears throat> in either case, spring replacement is your only option and would be well worth the expense in improved handling and you would have a wider range of adjustment. What we have done by adjusting the sag for this rider's weight is allow both the front and rear suspension to operate in a range of travel that will be optimum for his riding preferences and conditions. One other bonus I should mention is this. Once the sag is set, it makes compression and rebound adjustments much more effective. While the spring is responsible for how quickly or slowly the forks and shock compress and extend after hitting a bump, there is also another level of control. As they move up and down, the oil inside provides resistance to the motion. The damping adjustments on your bike are like a common water spigot. When you open them up, they allow the oil to flow more easily inside. This provides less resistance and allows the spring to compress and rebound rapidly. Closing them down restricts the flow. Compression damping controls how quickly the spring will take in the force of the bump. Rebound damping controls how quickly it will release it. The screw at the top of the forks is the rebound adjuster. And this one at the bottom is the compression. On the rear shock, it is backwards. The rebound adjustment is at the bottom and the compression at the top. Consult your owner's manual if you have any questions about your own shock or fork settings. That's it. Thanks for watching.